self-determination it's the ability to choose and I think that that's what we all should have a right to and that's what we're all fighting for public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves and a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate it's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentary films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren. En de Bali is zo'n plek. Hallo, goedenavond allemaal. Good evening everyone, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm wel welcome here in uh, the Bali. My name is Anna-Marijn Upker and I am a program editor here uh, at the Bali. And tonight I will be uh, your moderator. We have a really, really special guest in our midst. Her name is um, Olga Tokarchuk. And she has been a writer already for 30 years. I think this is really your anniversary year, right? because you started in 1989. Um, and we are here tonight to, um, to celebrate the book that was translated into, um, into Dutch and which is published now. Um, it's a magnificent work. I think it's 900 pages. Um, we're speaking about the books of Jacob. And tonight uh, we will speak with Olga Tokarczuk on her work uh, on this specific book and also about um, what literature can do for society. What is the power of fiction and um, um, how can literature influence societal developments? So what we're going to do uh, tonight, we're having a really packed program for you. We will um, have an introduction by Goshka Dieren, who read a lot uh, from your work and who will say a little bit more about why it's important, why it's so special and um, um, why you should all uh, start reading it or read more from her work. Um, after that, I will be having a conversation with Olga. We will listen to some uh, fragments of the Dutch translation of the book uh, performed by uh, Sam Gilane. And it will be good to know for you uh, is that we will uh, uh, publish the, um, the Polish translation of the fragments on the screen as well. So if you don't speak Dutch, you're totally fine during this evening. Um, at the next, uh, the, the next panel, Dore van Dijfbode will be uh, joining us. She wrote a book, My Polish House, uh, where she visited her, uh, her mom's family in Poland and uh, did interviews about what, um, how they relate to their history, how they can speak about their history, and also uh, why it's so difficult to speak about the dark pages of history uh, sometimes. And we will finish with another fragment. But um, before we're going to start, I wanted to ask Fritz van der Meij from Uitgeverij De Geus, because this is a uh, cooperation with Uitgeverij De Geus, to say a little bit about why this book uh, is so important and why you decided to translate it into uh, Dutch. I have a microphone over here for you. Thank you. Well, oh. A very warm welcome to everyone. I'm very happy that you all are here, especially Olga, of course. Uh, and Karel, uh, who's uh, the wonderful translator of uh, the Jacobs uh, book. Um, I'll tell you why I love the book so much. So I won't tell you, well, maybe a little bit also why I think it's important that we publish it. But the most important thing is it's, it's, it all starts with love, I think. <laughs> um, because the, the books of Jacob, they're a book that you do not want to finish. The story that Olga tells you about Jacob Frank 
gives you a feeling as if it is an eternal work. A story of hope that never ends. This book, it is, as you said, it's more than 900 pages and, and those pages start at the wrong end of the book because it is in the, in the, in the Hebrew fashion. This book is made of mysticism, of religion, of hopes for a better world, hopes for a better future. At the same time, you know while reading that the quest for that new world where everything will be different and better will not be very successful. And that is why I did not want to finish the book because you are afraid that in the end there's no hope left. But there is comfort in the end. The last three sentences of the book read, and I'll do that in Dutch in Karel Losman's translation. Ongetwijfeld is de wereld opgebouwd uit duisternis. Nu bevinden wij ons aan de kant van de duisternis. Maar er staat geschreven dat de mens die zich bekommert om de zaken van de Messias, zelfs als die niet geslaagd zijn, al zou hij alleen hun geschiedenis hebben verteld, behandeld zal worden als degene die de eeuwige geheimen van het licht bestudeert. And the statement in English is this. The world is made of darkness, and we are at the dark side. But it is written that a human being who worries about things of the Messiah, even if they fail, even if he only tells their history, will be treated as one who studies the eternal mysteries of light. Some Jewish families always set an extra plate on their dinner table. Some still do that to this day. That plate is for the Messiah. Because there's always the possibility that tonight he will come. That he will come any minute. And then you'd better be prepared. And I think that's a wonderful idea. You can always hope for a better life and that hope can be so strong that it's always on your mind, even when you are performing the most pract practical tasks, like setting the table. Most of the Polish Jews in the 18th century were poor, and that might be one of the reasons why their longing for a better life was so genuine and so strong. For them, a charismatic Messiah was the best possible incarnation of their dream. And dreams are, I think, what this book is made of. When I read the cinnamon shops by Bruno Schulz, here in Holland, beautifully translated by the late Gerard Rasch, I had a similar experience to what happened to me while reading the Jacob's scriptures. You enter a dream world, a mystical world where certain logical laws simply do not apply. When you enter Schultz's or Tukarchur's worlds, you feel grateful. These two authors have invented a world for you you did not know it existed. We, at least in Holland, were not very familiar with this history. A world that is mystical in probably a middle European way, maybe an Ashkenazi kind of way, with streaks of Roman Catholic, Catholicism in it, with Islam and many other religions that talk about a better world. You, Olga, you, I read that you said that you were influenced by Bruno Schulz. And that is one of two reasons why I brought Bruno Schulz up. The other one is that you feel the kinship between the two books, Jacob's scriptures and the cinnamon shops. They are dreamlike books, books that build new worlds, worlds that, where the laws of our mundane lives are not applicable. So for once, I'll urge you all not to read just one book. Of course, you should read Olga's book, but to read two. And if you do that, the better world that we all hope for, whether made possible by the Messiah or by the stuff that dreams are made of, will be 
I hope, a little bit closer. And that's thanks to you, Olga Tsukarczuk. Thank you very much for this wonderful introduction. introduction. I would like to announce the second speaker of tonight, Koshka Dideren. Um, she is uh, the member of the board of Stichting Literatura. Give her a warm hand, maybe, yeah. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I want to introduce shortly um, Olga Tokarczuk as one of the best, or maybe the best, Polish writers, very interesting and very successful. She was born in the west of Poland, but her family comes from the east part of Poland, which before the war was um, part of Poland and after the war, Russia, now it's Ukrainian. Uh, she studied psychology in Warsaw, lived for a couple of years in Wrocław, and then in, 18, in 1986 moved to Nova Ruda, a small, pla small place, small city in Lower Silesia. She loves um, to be there and she loves to live there. And uh, this is the region where uh, people from uh, different backgrounds live together. And she's very active in, uh, uh, in local community life. Um, she organizes uh, 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 literature uh, 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 festival uh, called Guri Literatury from, 19, uh, for, from uh, 2015. And in 2015, she got a prize uh, called Brücke. And this, is a prize, uh, this prize is a joint undertaking of German and Polish border twin cities aimed at advancing mutual, regional, and European peace, understanding and cooperation among people of different nationalities cultures and viewpoints. Um, uh, Olga Tukarczuk published her first story in 1979 under pseudonym Natasha Borodin. Uh, only in, uh, after the fall of the wall in 1993, she published her no uh, novel under her own name, Podróż Ludzi Księgi, The Journey of the Book People. And this book uh, was quite popular between both readers and critics and brought her popularity in Poland. In 1997, uh, uh, her book, Prawiek i inne czasy, translated into Dutch by Karol Lesman under the title Ur en andere Teide, was nominated for the first time for most important Polish literature prize, Nike. Karol Lesman uh, translated another two books of Olga, Dom Dziemny, Dom Nocny, Haus van de, uh, van de, for the Dach, Haus for the Nacht, and uh, Ostatnie Historie, De Laatste Verhale, Drie Frauen over het Leve, Family and the Dot. And now I want to highlight um, most important books of Olga. The first one is Bieguni, in Dutch, De Rustelose, translated by uh, Gret Paulein in 2011. This book was published in Poland in 2008 and uh, got the, the, the most important prize, Nike, uh, together with, uh, with the prize uh, of the readers. This is uh, the book not about uh, traveling and destinations. This is a book about phenomenon of travel. The book explores what it means to be a traveler, a wanderer, a body in mo motion, not only through the space, but also through the time. It, uh, the, the, the Polish title, Bieguni, refers to the religious group from Russia who believed that only on the move, only traveling, they can avoid, um, escape the evil. But the book includes a lot of different stories. Um, uh, one, some of these stories, this is, uh, for example, about the uh, 17th century Dutch anatomist Frederick Reusch. And to, to examine the life and the, the work of him, Olga spent some months in Amsterdam as guest of letter and fonts and writer in residence. Another story goes about uh, uh, Chopin's heart carried by his sister back to Warsaw, or about young men slowly descending in madness after his, his wife and his child was mysteriously disappeared. The English, uh, uh -huh. and uh, in the review of Dutch paper, 
Trau, Antoine Ferbe, had written about this book. There is still hope for literature. Olga Tokarczuk has written an extraordinary book. Extraordinary here means both unusual and special. And special means exceptionally good, extremely intelligent, extremely poetic, exceptionally eccentric, and particularly philosophical. The English translating, translation of this book, titled Flights uh, by Jennifer Croft, uh, won um, uh, the Man Booker International Prize in 2018, last year. Um, then um, the second book, which I want to highlight, highlight this is Prowadź swój pług przez kości umarły. The English title, Drive your plow over the bones of, of the dead. The book was published in Poland in 2009. And uh, the, the, this is written like a thriller. The main character, Janina Dusheko, is an eccentric old women, woman living in the small city in Lower Silesia. And uh, she relates uh, a series of deaths in the city uh, to the revenge of wild animals on hunters. Um, in 2017, Agnieszka Holland made a film, a thriller, based on this uh, novel. Uh, the title of the film was Pocket, Spore in Dutch English. <laughs> And um, the, the, the film won uh, a silver bear at the 67th Berlin International Film Festival. Uh, and again, the English translation of this book by Antonia Lloyd-Jones uh, got, uh, is, is again, uh, has nomination on this year long list for the Man Booker International Prize. Maybe it's nice to know that another book on this list is Tommy Wieringa, so it, it will be exciting. <laughs> The um, Guardian um, had, uh, in the review of this book, had written this existential thriller by one of the Europe's major humanist writers offers thought-provoking ideas on our perceptions of madness, injustice against marginalized people, animal rights, the hypocrisy of traditional religion, belief in predestination, and caused a genuine political uproar in Tokarczuk, native Poland. Now, and then um, again, the, 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 the book, the last book I want to highlight, this is of course Księgi Jakubowe, Jakob's book and the translation of uh, Karol Lesman, which just now um, was published. Well, I don't know if, if I have to tell uh, a lot about it because we started, but uh, the, the, what I want to say about this book is that it's in Poland called uh, Opus Magnum of uh, Olga Tokarczuk. It's a very beautiful written um, epic novel. It was published in 2014. It was immediately very popular and a big success. Uh, 170,000 copies were uh, sold and this remained a bestseller on Polish, uh, in Poland for, 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 for many months. And the book has uh, got uh, again the highest Polish literature praise, Nike. Um, uh, I will shortly, I don't know if everybody knows the book, but uh, the book uh, this is, uh, tells the story of Jacob Frank, an 18th century Jewish leader born in Poland, who uh, travels with his followers uh, through Austrian Imperium and, uh, and Commonwealth of Poland. He uh, converts himself temporarily to Islam and Catholicism. And the book uh, tells the story from different perspectives by dozens of uh, uh, narrators, people who loved him and who hated him, who admired him for his charisma and who hated him for narcissism. But it also refers to modern times. And as uh, Boston Review writes, Jacob becomes for Tokarczuk a vehicle to explore, explore a slew of questions about interfaith dialogue the viability of free love, the international systems of patronage that supports thinkers and artists, and the purpose of amassing bodies of cultural and scientific knowledge. The Book of Jacobs reaffirms the importance of Jewish culture to Central and Eastern Europe. It also reminds its readers of the role of Polish people in particular uh, played in the gradual suppression of the region's multiculturalism. And um, 
the book is, is, uh, is really amazing, it's beautiful, and it's uh, considered a masterpiece of Olga Tokarczuk. And uh, at the end, I want to, uh, to, to, to mention that uh, the last book of Olga Tokarczuk, I, I have read it last year. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a book, Opowiadania Bizarne, Bizarre Stories, Bizarre Ferhale. And when I've read it, I had to think about uh, the, the, the popular Netflix series Black Mirror. According to me, the, 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 the many stories from this book would, would perfectly fit as, as screenplays for the next episodes of this series. Really brilliant. And uh, at the end, I want to quote uh, what the writer herself writes or says what, what writing novels means to her. Writing a novel is for me like telling myself fairy tales for grown-ups, like children do before they fall asleep. They use their own language. On the borderline between sleep and reali reality, they describe things, but they also fantasize. So welcome in the world of Olga Tokarczuk. I wish everybody a nice evening. Thank you very much, uh, Goshka Dieterin. Um, now I would like to introduce uh, my main guest of tonight. Please uh, come and take a seat here in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really amazing that you're here. Yeah. Um, I wanted to start at the beginning, actually, because I, uh, you started working in a hospital um, why on earth did you become a writer? That's the funny story. But <laughs> before I'm going to tell you this story, I would like to thank you very much, Karol Lesman, who is the great translator of Polish literature. And mm -hmm. without you, Karol, this book couldn't yeah. exist, of course, in this language, beautiful Dutch language. Mm -hmm. And also, thank you, Fritz. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, Fritz. Uh, the Heus is my beloved publishing house, and we know, we know each other with the Heus a uh, long time, and I'm really happy that you decided to publish this, this brick, as I would call this. <laughs> this. <laughs> and what else? And then um, I would like to mention on the beginning, if I have uh, time and possibility, that I owe very much to Netherlands, because many times I, I was here, I was invited here. I spent, uh, I had uh, two scholarships and a uh, smoking cigarette just before this event. I recalling myself many years ago when I was here on the scholarship and I finishing my book, Drive Your Plow Through the Bones of the Dead. Mm -hmm. And I was crying because I, wasn't able to kill my figure from this detective story, and <laughs> uh, she was a murderer, so uh -huh, she yeah. she um, she should be punished in the end. But yeah. I couldn't do it, so this is a special <laughs> end of this book. <laughs> so um, you ask me why I decided to change my profession? Yeah, because I think that. Uh, um, the, the sources of writing and helping people as a therapist was the same, in fact. Mm -hmm. So it was the, the listening somebody's stories mm -hmm. and to try to find a kind of communication with the other one mm -hmm. and also to find the perfect communication with another human being. Mm -hmm. But I think that I'm too neurotic to be a therapist. Yeah. So Why are you too once. Neurotic? You yeah. must be a little bit of neurotic to yeah, write. Yeah, I think that many of writers are neurotic, so I'm not uh, uh, different from them. <laughs> but once I remember such a situation that I had a client when I worked with him, it was a man, mm -hmm. and then I had a, such a thought in my head, oh my God, uh, I am much more disturbed than you are. Oh. So, <laughs> So I decided. I'm way more shocked by your stories than <laughs> you yourself. Yeah, and then I I thought uh, mm. that it would be better for me and for my yeah. clients to change the profession. What was the story? To tell, yeah, that was a story. What um, I don't remember exactly in in details, but that is the, the endless story that we are 
Uh, we cannot manage, manage with ourselves. We cannot find a mm. way of communication with the other mm. people. That the world sometimes is too heavy for our, you know, yeah. fragile backs, yeah. fragile bodies. So then I decided that uh, it's too much to me and then I quit my job, mm -hmm. my profession. I spent one year somewhere traveling mm -hmm. and then I came back with the book, with my first book. Ah. So that was the beginning of my writing. And it was uh, immediately a success? Uh, yeah, I got a prize for this book, which, uh, of course, it was a great advantage. And then uh, I, I decided to, to, to write as a profession, mm -hmm. so never come back to, to psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. And I think that it was the best psychotherapy yeah, for me. I would say, like, did it make your life easier? Because now you can only focus on your own world and shape That's your own world and shape your own... So I am only can be responsible for myself, not mm -hmm. for other people. So. Mm -hmm. It's perhaps better. <laughs> so we're jumping a little bit um, through history, but um, I wanted to go to this wonderful book that is uh, in front of us. And um, it's about um, Jacob Frank. He's the main figure um, of, this, um, of this magnificent work. How did you came to this figure? Because it's a historical figure. How did you um, came across this person and why did he uh, attract you so much? Mm -hmm. That was many years ago. Um, I was somewhere in a small town on the north of Poland and I went to the small bookstore and then I found out the old book. Uh, I started to read this book and then I realized that I have a great, great story. But of course, uh, I've never been in my life a fan of historical novels, mm -hmm. so I, I really... So didn't <laughs> know anything about uh, how to write and uh, did such a novel. And my first idea was to write an essay about this figure. Hmm. Because I realized that th this story is uh, so strong and so full of advent adventures and also so many such a, um, important points mm -hmm. that I, my first question was why this story of Jacob Frank is not so obvious for everybody in Poland yeah. and all over the world. Because how, how, how um, well known is he in Poland, this figure? Uh, now, after my book, is quite He's, well known. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but before, I think that only a small you, group of people... Did you ever heard of him before you opened this book in the bookshop? Somewhere, yes. Okay. Just... I had some associations, but not yeah. uh, as, a, as a consisting story, no. But then I realized that the story is so strong that it was many reasons to sweep this story under the carpet from many points of view. And then I think that there are three such a most important points of view which are very not comfortable for, for Poles hmm. in what general. So, for instance, uh, I think that the first group uh, which tries to actively forget the story mm -hmm. was uh, the Orthodox Jews. Mm -hmm. Because for them, Jacob Frank was a traitor. He was a heretic Jew. Right? Her heretic Jews, m Jewish mystic, and telling the very un 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 uncomfortable yes. um, yeah, stories about uh, 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 Judaism, I would say. Mm -hmm. So he... His background was, uh, he was uh, um, Sephardic Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, his family came to Central Europe from Spain, probably. And he was a poor merchant. But from the other side, he grew up in a uh, very um, mixture society mm -hmm. full of syncretical, syncretical uh, religion from the southern Europe. So it was in this, uh, this uh, beliefs, there are many uh, ideas taken directly from Judaism, mm -hmm. but also from Gnosticism, for all Orthodox Church, for Christianity in general, from Islam. But it were so really it was a kind of mixture. tolerant times as well in Poland. Sorry? It were really tolerant times in Poland, yeah. like so many religions. At the time, uh, yeah, and for time. instance, Poland at the time, it is uh, the, the, the middle of 18th century, it was a big kingdom between the uh, Baltic Sea and the Black Sea, mm -hmm. so it's a really huge part of, mm -hmm. of Eastern Europe. So Orthodox Jews really hated him, and yeah. they have a 
kind of uh, politics to remove his name from from the chronicles from mm -hmm. his day history. And what were the other reasons not to read? Yeah, the, the second reason was, of course, uh, that Polish Catholic Church was not, not, not felt not so comfortable mm. with this, this figure because Jacob Frank uh, was imprisoned by Polish Catholic Church in mm -hmm. Częstochowa, which is the, the most uh, holy place in, in Polish beliefs. Mm -hmm with the main figure of Holy Mother with the black face, very, very mystical one. So he was imprisoned there and um, he changed this place uh, into the, 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 the place of his heresy for this 13 years of being imprisoned mm -hmm. there. So it, is, it was a kind of blasphemy. And also the role of Catholic yeah. Church was very uh, dark um, towards uh, Jacob Frank and recalls us uh, uh, activity of inquisition. Mm -hmm. And what made this, this story so special for you that you thought, I'm going to stick to this, I'm going to... Yeah, there is also the third point okay, I yeah. would like Make, to, yeah. to come back. <laughs> that, first of all. Uh, because um, mm, Frankists, I mean acolytes of uh, Jacob Frank, they uh, successfully uh, as assimilated with Polish society. So for the senders of those people, mm -hmm. it was also uncomfortable to, to, rec to, to come back to their the past, to the history of their families. Mm -hmm. In a Polish quite anti-Semitic society, they, they decided to, to keep, keep uh, their past in secret. Mm -hmm. So there are three reasons why yeah. the story was so yeah. uh, uneasy. Yeah and it was really wept un un under the car uh, uh, carpet. Mm -hmm. So for me as a writer, it was a kind of challenge. And I thought, mm, thought to myself that it will be great to, to do something with this story. And I, on the beginning, I was very naive. I thought that it will be just, uh, just two or three expedition to my library and I will find mm -hmm. everything what I need. Mm -hmm. Of course, it was just uh, my naï naivety. And I Sometimes you just have to start somewhere and then you... Yeah, and then um, it became my, the biggest research I did in my life. So uh, it was a many... Uh, I have to, to visit many archives, many libraries, and also we spent with my, my husband um, two years traveling around the Europe and trying... Because I am writer, not historian, so... I have to touch everything by yeah, myself. To experience, uh, yeah, to smell, to, well, to touch, yeah. to see. So yeah. we were uh, going on the on the um, traces of Jakob Frank everywhere right. from Ukraine, through Turkey, Bulgaria, Romania, Czech Republic, to to the last places of his life. I mean, uh, Germany. Mm -hmm. And what struck you during this travel, or what kind of insights did it give you? I learn a lot. Yeah. I learn such a small things. So uh, most of people, uh, perhaps uh, even ha haven't noticed. For instance, uh, I wanted to know what they ate, what they, what they, how they dressed, uh, how they travel, what was the, the the way of traveling at the time, how they sleep. Um, how it looked, but just simply the, the, the light of, of the small villages in Romania, for instance. I think how this was also ne necessary because your book is very detailed. Yeah, because detailed. I'm a writer, so yeah. the, you know, the literature is the question of <laughs> but details. But not all literature is so... But yeah, I lyrical. believe in such a literature that uh, it, it has to, to talk about details, really, yeah. because this is the, the very important thing. So, for instance, just a small anecdote. When the book was nearly ready and it was just checked by Polish historians to, oh, yeah. to, because of those details, yes. uh, I used to put everywhere mm, potatoes. It, I, I expected that, because we are eating potatoes now as a Poles, you know, so it was obvious for everybody and it was endless in also in the past and mm, obvious in the past and uh, those con consultant working mm -hmm. for publishing house they uh, paid attention that potatoes wasn't so obvious at the time ah. in central europe and you know what we ate at the time rice 
rice from Turkey. So in the end, we change <laughs> everything, you know, uh, every single sentence <laughs> with potatoes into Contra rice. Contra F uh, yeah. potatoes. <laughs> so such a small, small details, small things. Yeah. And another thing, for <laughs> instance, there is a scene in the book when the women are sitting and uh, sewing. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then they use uh, small needles and the light is blinking on these metal mm -hmm. needles. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, oh, something wrong is going. My intu intuition mm. was working. And I check, of course, uh, that it was impossible to use metal needles. And of course, <gasps> there is impossible to have this bleak in this beautiful scene. I had to change the Why needles was it into... Those because it was too early for, ah, for metal yeah, yeah. needles. Perhaps here in Netherlands, yes, but not in this part of Europe. <laughs> I don't know if we yeah, have needles yeah, at the so, time. <laughs> so they use wooden needles yeah. For, yeah. for sewing. How long did it take you to put together this... Uh so I think, now I, I, I try to forget it's this okay. entire you know, effort. But I, I can th imagine. <laughs> <laughs> But I think that we did this research, I, I'm saying we, because my husband was very present in this work, yeah. uh, for f four, s four or five years. Mm -hmm. And then I've, I've used to write this book, I think, I don't know, five, six years once again. So wow. I think that um, being here in, in Amsterdam for this scholarship, mm, finishing uh, Drive Your Plow Through the Bones of the mm -hmm. Dead, I've already had some first chapters, so yeah. Oh, yeah. I can say that also the beginning of this book was was here, Great. coming here from from Netherlands. Good news. Um, you, this is an is, is a historical novel. At the same time, you say I'm a, I, I want to write fairy tales, and I was wondering: is everything based on facts in this book, or is there also things, details that you? imagined during your trip that you added to mm -hmm. to the facts? Mm. I was sure from the beginning that uh, writing historical novel is a very important and very important thing and I have to be very responsible for mm. it. Yeah. So I can say now that uh, it is very good based on f historical mm -hmm. facts. And the, the technique I invented to write this model, this novel, I can call conjecture, which is the <coughs> old uh, the, the expression for work for for um, archivist archives, yeah. right? Um, historian, historian, historian. So um, you, th this is like an image. You have a um, water and stones, and you can pass the water. St um, making uh, steps on the stones, but among the stones are, you know, the, the empty space. So my my imagination yeah. was working only in between Filling those in the empty facts. Spaces, yeah. So this is like a, you know um, fulfilling gaps between facts. Yeah. So I feel that you cannot find out really bigger mis historical mistakes in this book. Mm -hmm. Yes, in some details, of course, I I, I could make some mistakes, especially the subject was uh, extremely difficult because my heroes, my, my figures from these books, mm -hmm. for instance, they live in many cultures yeah. and they, they used to, to use many languages from Ladino, which is the old Jewish la language mixture uh, based on Spanish mm -hmm. uh, through uh, Hebrew, um, mm, uh, German, uh, Turkish, Polish, of course, and so on. So uh, it was extremely difficult to navigate between all those uh, languages and yeah, cultures. I can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to touch upon one theme in the book. Of course, there's a lot to discuss, but we have to keep it a bit short. Um, um, but in your work, religion plays an important role. Actually, in, mo in, in many of your works, we see this uh, theme back, and it's uh, important in this book as well. Um, and, and also spirituality, and how do you how do you relate to this? Or because uh, you're a film, uh, Spore, uh, Potok, uh, Pokot, Pokot. Um, um, is also being accused of being anti-Catholic, uh, anti for example. Mm -hmm. So what is your relation with religion? What? Um, I think that, uh, I believe that religion is a kind of instinct that many of us 
has this deep need for spirituality and understanding the world as a not only those material things which are around us, but looking for something outside, yeah. that this is a very deep need we have. And there is no possible to, to describe the world without paying attention of this, mm -hmm. on, on this need. You're also inspired by Carl Jung. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm Jungian. I was Jungian as a, as a yeah. younger uh, writer. Now I changed my mind a little bit. Okay. Uh, <laughs> But uh, so religion is important and especially I'm interested in this kind of religion which, is, which always try to transcend something, also yeah. uh, go out from the, the, what we know and uh, also to, broke some border, to break some borders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so religion can be treated, can be perceived as a something very positive in a sense of uh, making us but more conscious. But at the consciously. same time, religion mm -hmm. can impose a lot of, of borders course, as of well. Course, so. Of course. When the religion became becoming institution and uh, the tool of uh, um, uh, power and the tool of aggression, suppression, yes. So uh, I think that to be religious is always checking the borders all the time. So I like heresy. Every every. A single uh, case of, of uh, heresy is, it seems to me, very opening for us. Mm -hmm. So it, it, um, it um, showing us the borders and also uh, asking the question how to, to transcend, transcend those, those borders, to ask mm -hmm. about something which is uh, outside. So. Um, Sometimes people can understand religion in a very narrow sense, yeah. so that's the problem with my, my book, Drive Your Plow Through the Bones of the Dead, because yeah. the main subject of this book is, uh, this is a kind of small moral story about a good uh, mm, person who recognize that the law mm -hmm. in which she lives is not moral yeah. anymore. Yeah. So it is the, the main question of this book, how we can behave in, towards such a problem? How, yeah. wh wh where are our borders? So, yeah. What should you do if the law obstructs your morality in a way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing before we go to uh, Carol and the first uh, fragment, I was wondering, what do you think made um, uh, Jacob Frank so attract, uh, such an attractive religious leader? That was also my uh, was first uh, yeah. question, why I am so interested in, 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 into him. Yeah, and why was he so su successful as well? Uh -huh. Because I think that the story is, first of all, it is a story of emancipation that uh, on the beginning we have a group of people who, which are just poor Jewish merchants living on the, on, the, on the periphery of the Polish society mm -hmm. somewhere. And then, in a very brave way, they are, in the end of this book, they are finding themselves on the top of this society. Mm -hmm. So there is a kind of way from the bottom to the up. Mm -hmm. uh, this kind of em emancipation we know only from the French Revolution, I would say. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, Jacob Frank was a, well, uh, he was a precursor, yeah, mm -hmm. such a precursor of uh, this thinking in the in a rev revolutionary way about society. Mm -hmm. That society is nothing which is really something stable and uh, close, mm -hmm. but society is always something like a, a life structure, you know, and uh, the main. Uh, Mm, the main uh, pattern of society is endless negotiations of positions of human beings in society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is also a story about, a uh, very contemporary story in fact, about emancipation and about uh, so-called uh, foreign, foreign or alien people knocking to our doors and asking us, come on, open the doors, we are here, we are also going mm -hmm. to, we are also would like to join you. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the story of those 
poor Jewish merchant trying to assimilate yeah. in a quite um, um, a fixed uh, feudal, in fact, society of Polish mm -hmm. uh, Catholics, Polish kingdom. All right. Um, I wanted to go to Carol. I'm coming to you. With the, maybe you could stand up. Uh, so uh, people can see you. I don't want to make you feel very uncomfortable, but um, yeah, we really have something to celebrate tonight. Um, it's your amazing work. It's um, um, how, where did you start? What was your idea at the beginning? Yes, I started from the first page. I, I read the book. <laughs> but it was and, actually yeah, page 902, right? So. No, 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 it was, oh. I, I did not. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, Mag ook in het Nederlands, als het fijn is. Ik heb het in het Engels gezegd. Of course, ik heb het boek en ik wilde gewoon het vertalen. En het was een beetje moeilijk om te vinden een editor, maar ik vind het de editor. Dus ik denk dat het een great boek is. En alles wat Fritz vertelt vandaag, het kan mijn woorden zijn, natuurlijk. Ik wil echt u voor het vertellen about uh, the book uh, in the way you did. So um, I spoke about the process as well with Olga for a bit. Uh -huh. It took her a long time. How long did it took you to make the uh, a translation? 16 months. 16 months. Yes. Full time work. Yes, but um, I had this system. I put the alarm clock at 4.44. <laughs> in the morning? Yes. So I went oh up and I worked some hours. Then I went back to sleep. And uh, when I finish four pages, then I, I four to pages speak. between yes, four to, forty to, and to, to translate to to, um, to correct etc etc. Yeah. And then when I was a little bit tired, I went to bed again. I put the alarm clock at uh, nine sixteen or nine forty four. That's a really specific time frame yes. as well. Okay. It's the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah is working all the time with me. Ah, so, it's Kabbalah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and and um, so. In fact, I had two days in a day, so I worked 32 months on this book. Ah. <laughs> <You see? laughs> All right. I should try that as well. To, to Sorry? I should try that as well, yeah. so I would have the, more no, time. No, it's not good for your body. It's not ah. good for your mind now. What hap what ha was there a moment uh, somewhere in this process where you thought, okay, I'm totally done with this. Never, never. I'll never, just never, throw never. it away. It's, it's, I quit. It's, it's, My family no, doesn't see me anymore. No. My friends don't see me. I, I stop all the... Yeah. Um, yes. no. Do you still have people left? Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> they, they also believed in this, uh, in this yeah? mission. Yeah. Did they support yeah. you? Yeah. yeah, they did. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're going to listen to uh, um, uh, a, f a short, or actually this is kind of a, a longer fragment from, yeah. uh, from the book. It's, we will read the Dutch translation, because yeah. of course we're here to celebrate the Dutch translation. Um, can you maybe introduce a little bit um, uh, where we are in the book, the context, where do we start, uh, where are we going to listen to? As I have to say to Olga, uh, I, 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 I cho chose the fragment, so yeah. maybe you do not even know what uh, the, you, you don't. You do know, or you do no, know. No, I don't fragments. know, but it will be great surprise for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first fragment uh, we are in uh, 1760, 61, and Jacob is uh, arrived with his uh, Chavura, his campaign in Warsaw, in, in Poland. Yeah. And um, he is just the day, the year before, he's baptized in Lvov, in Lviv. Yeah. And uh, he um, is now looking for support because he is poor and the, the, the followers are poor. Yeah. And there is this ar ar aristocracy in the person of Mr. Miss, uh, Madame uh, Katarzyna Kosakowska, mm -hmm. who is even letting them live in, the, um, in her. Uh, belongings. So we, we, we find him in in a, in a um, encounter with this astrocracy and mm -hmm. because Frank didn't speak Polish so yeah. he has a translator with him. Oh, <laughs> Molivda. Molivda yeah. is, is a nickname and his real name is Antoni Kosakowski. His spokesperson. Yes. And he thinks he thinks he's related to um, uh, Kosakowska but Kosakowska doesn't uh, really believe that. He is a very uh, interesting person, this Molivda, but it's yeah. too, 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 
too short time to sp speak more about it. I think we, we're just going to listen to it, right? Uh, okay. Or is there okay. anything you okay. would okay. Like, we need to know before? No, no, maybe. No? Well, maybe. Um, no, I think everything will be clear. Okay, for the moment. okay. Uh, Tom Gilane, the floor is yours. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, so before I start, I want to say that my Polish is also not so good. So um, excuse me already for m maybe some mistakes in the uh, Polish names. I'll, I'll try my best. Over de gebeurtenissen in Warschau en de pauzelijke nuncius. Het eerste wat Jacob in Warschau doet, is een rijtuig huren met drie paarden. Nu rijdt hij zelf mennend door de hoofdstad. De paarden zijn op een vreemde manier ingespannen, de een, of ander, wat de, de een voor de ander, wat de aandacht trekt en de hele straat staat stil om dit vreemde tafereel te aanschouwen. Ook huurt hij een niet al te groot paleis achter de ijzeren poort met een koetshuis en een stal en zeven gemeubileerde kamers, zodat iedereen die uit Ljublin meekomt erin kan. De meubels zijn mooi en schoon, gestoffeerd met damast, er zijn spiegels, kisten en canapés. Het paleis heeft ook tegelkachels. Boven staat een groot bed dat hij onmiddellijk netjes laat opmaken met schone lakens. Geholpen door Moljevda neemt hij een lakei in dienst, een kokin en een meisje, om het vuur aan te maken en op te ruimen. De contacten van Slo slotvoogdes Kosakowska hebben al effect. Als eerste wordt hij uitgenodigd door de heer Bra Branitschki en daarna wil iedereen deze neofiet en puritein in zijn salon hebben. Bijvoorbeeld de Jablonovskis, bij wie Jacob furoren maakt, in zijn bonte Turkse kledij. Alle aanwezigen zijn op zijn Frans gekleed en kijken vol belangstelling en sympathie door hun lorgnons naar deze vreemde, pokdalige, maar toch knappe man. In Polen is het vreemde altijd aantrekkelijker dan het eigene. En daarom prijzen ze de exotische kledij die de nieuwkomer hun demonstreert. De heren benadrukken tevreden dat ze in hem goede wil als heer zien. Even ontstaat er een grappige situatie als het hondje van de gast uh, prinses Anna zijn pootje oplicht en met een straaltje de mooie gele schoenen van de gast besprenkelt. De prinses beschouwt dit als het zoveelste bewijs van grote sympathie. Ditmaal die van een hond. En alle verheugen zich over het goede voorteken. Na de Jablonovskis zijn het de Potokskis, eveneens welgezind. En sindsdien geven de grote huizen dit curiosum elkaar van hand tot hand door. Jacob zegt niet veel. Hij praat geheimzinnig. Hij probeert de vragen van de nieuwsgierigen te beantwoorden... En Moljevda maakt mooier wat Jacob heeft gezegd, zodat hij doorgaat voor een van nature verstandige en serieuze man. Soms vertelt hij de een of andere anekdote en dan maakt Moljevda de details op een fraaie manier rond. Hij moet vernuftigd de in Jacobs toon doorklinkende eigen lof retoucheren. Die past niet bij de hoge drempels van de aristocratische salons waar bescheidenheid de mode is. Jacobs eigen lof doet het wel weer in de voorstedelijke kroegen, doet het wel goed in de voorstedelijke kroegen, waar ze nu al een paar keer na een saaie opera terecht zijn gekomen. De volgende die hen ontvangt is de pauzelijke nuncius Serra. Deze oudere, welverzorgde man met spierwitte haren kijkt met een ondoorgrondelijke gelaatsuitdrukking naar hem. Als ze spreken knikt hij even, alsof hij het volledig met hen eens is. Jacob laat zich bijna inpakken door deze beminnelijke en clementie. Door deze beminnelijkheid en clementie. Maar Moljevda weet dat de man een sluwe vos is. Je komt er nooit achter wat hij werkelijk denkt. Dat leren ze. De rust bewaren. Veel tijd hebben. Aandachtig kijken, zorgvuldig argumenten wegen. Jacob spreekt Turks. Moljevda vertaalt het in het Latijn. Een mooie jonge klerk noteert alles onverschillig aan een apart tafeltje. Jacob, deze Frank hier, begint Moljev daar namens Jacob te spreken, is met vrouw en kinderen en een zestigtal van zijn medebroeders van Turkse bodem vertrokken. Na eerder zijn haven te zijn kwijtgeraakt en zonder een andere taal dan enkele Oriëntaalse te kennen, 
die hier nergens van nut zijn, vandaar dat ik als tolk moet optreden. Zozeer werden zij tot het christelijk geloof aangetrokken. Maar hier kennen ze geen enkele gewoonte, hebben ze moeilijkheden met in hun onderhoud te voorzien, daar ze leven van de aalmoezen van goede mensen. Hij ziet de nieuwsgierige en enigszins ironische blik van de nuntius en voegt hieraan toe, wat hij heeft is het resultaat van de vrijgevigheid van onze magnaten. En daarenboven ondervindt dit nobele volkje vele vervolgingen van de kant van de Talmudisten, zoals nu in Ljubljen, waar het is gekomen tot een bloederige aanval op vreedzame reizigers. En het ergste is dat ze nergens heen kunnen en alleen ergens te gast kunnen zijn in de kost bij vreemden. Jacob knikt, alsof hij alles begrepen heeft. Misschien begrijpt hij het ook wel. Gedurende zoveel eeuwen zijn wij uit elk land verjaagd. Zoveel eeuwen waren wij ten prooi aan voortdurende onzekerheid. En hebben wij niet als bezadigde mensen wortel kunnen schieten. En als je geen wortels hebt, ben je niemand, voegt Moljefta er uit zichzelf aan toe. Vluchtig dons, pas in de zespospolietie. Uh, Polietta hebben, <laughs> hebben we bescherming gevonden, gesteund door koninklijke edicten en een zorgzame houding van de kerk. Hier werpt Moldjevja, Moldjevja een uh, snelle blik op Jacob, die, zo blijkt het, aandachtig naar de vertaling luistert. Wat zouden we God een plezier doen als dit handjevol mensen, dat in goede verstandhouding met anderen wil leven, nu toestemming werd verleend zich op een eigen territorium te vestigen? Het is alsof de geschiedenis is afgesloten en alles weer naar de oude orde is teruggekeerd. En welk, grote, en welk grote verdienste zou Polen niet bij God hebben, groter dan de rest van de wereld die zo onwelwillend jegens de joden is? Moljevja merkt niet eens vanaf welk moment hij in plaats van zij, wij begint te zeggen. Want het is zo dat Moljevja dit al zo vele malen heeft gezegd dat de zinnen hem verdacht afgerond en fraai uit de mond komen. En het is allemaal... Te voor de hand liggend, zelfs te saai. Er zou, iemand zijn, zou er iemand zijn die anders kunnen denken? Daarom hernieuwen wij ten ene male ons verzoek... ons in de buurt van de Ottomaanse grens een apart territorium toe te wijzen. Di formar un intera populazione in situ prossimo allo stato ottomano. Onwillekeurig herhaalt de enorm charmante jonge klerk het in het Italiaans... en zwijgt vervolgens geheel rood aangelopen. De nuntius wijst er na een moment van stilzwijgen op dat sommige magnaten het nobele volkje met genoegen op hun landgoederen uitnodigen. Maar daarop antwoordt Jacob bij monden van Moljevda, we zouden bang zijn tot een overgave te worden, te worden gemaand onder welke de ongelukkige bewoners van de dorp in Polen zuchten. Miseri habitatori della campagna, zo luidt het gefluister van de klerk die zich kennelijk op die manier helpt bij het schrijven. Daarom smeekt... Implora, Jacob Frank, in naam van zijn volgelingen om hun een aparte plek toe te wijzen. Het liefst nog een geheel eigen plaats, een logo particulare, waarbij hun tegelijkertijd wordt toegezegd dat als ze op die plek allemaal samen, uniti, zullen zijn, ze zich met eigen industrie kunnen bezighouden en bij hun vervolgens uit het zicht zullen kunnen verdwijnen. Dan fleurt de nuntjes weer op en geeft te kennen dat hij met de grote grootkanselier, kroonkanselier heeft gesproken, die zijn goede wil heeft getoond door hun toe te staan zich in de kroongebieden te vestigen. Dan worden zij koninklijke onderdanen. De kerk op haar beurt is bereid hen in de steden op te nemen die onder de bisschoppelijke jurisdictie vallen. Moljevda laat luidruchtig de lucht uit zijn longen ontsnappen. Maar Jacob knippert nog niet met zijn ogen naar aanleiding van dit goede nieuws. Daarna komt het gesprek op de doop. Dat die per se plechtig en ten overstaan van iedereen dient te worden herhaald. Dat hij nog een keer moet plaatsvinden met alle pracht en praal onder het oog van de koning. Wie weet, misschien stemt een van de belangrijkste hoogwaardigheidsbekleders wel in met een peetvaderschap. De audiëntie zit erop. De nuntjes zet zijn beleefde masker op. Hij is bleek alsof hij al lange tijd dit luxe paleis niet meer heeft verlaten. Als je goed naar hem kijkt kan je zien dat zijn handen beven. Jacob loopt zelfverzekerd naar de gangen van het paleis. Hij slaat met zijn handschoenen in zijn hand. Moljefda dribbelt in stilzwijgen achter hem aan. Enkele priestersecretarissen ontwijken hem door zich tegen de muur te drukken. Pas in het rijtuig halen ze weer vrij adem. 
Net als in Smyrna, waar, wanneer hij tevreden was, trekt Jacob Moljefda, Moljefda's gezicht naar zich toe en, en zoent hem met een lach op zijn mond. Bij het huis van Jacob staan nachtman Piotr Jakobski en Jeruchim Dembowski te wachten. Jacob begroet hen op een nieuwe, merkwaardige manier die Moljefda nog niet eerder heeft gezien. Hij brengt zijn hand naar zijn mond en legt die vervolgens tegen zijn hart. En ze herhalen vol vertrouwen, zoals gewoonlijk zonder te aarzelen, dit gebaar. En even later ziet het eruit alsof ze dit altijd al zo hebben gedaan. Ze vragen door elkaar naar bijzonderheden. Maar Jacob passeert hen en verdwijnt in de deuropening. Moldjevja gaat zogenaamd als zijn woordvoerder, als een koninklijke minister achter hem aan en zegt tegen de anderen... Hij heeft moeiteloos de nuntjes weten te overtuigen. Hij heeft gesproken alsof hij het tegen een kind had. Hij weet dat dit precies is wat ze willen horen. En hij ziet wat voor een enorme indruk dit op hen maakt. Hij doet alle deuren voor Jacob open en loopt vervolgens vlak achter hem aan. Terwijl Nachman en Jeruchim daar weer achteraan trippelen. Hij heeft het idee dat wat ooit was weer terug is. Het plezier om met Jacob tijd door te brengen. En in zijn ongewone zij het voor een mens oog onzichtbare aureool te verwijlen. So I think now I understand. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now I understand why Carol had chosen this fragment because this fragment is about translation, about many languages and how the translation can be tricky, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah, huh? very clever. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But uh, now I I, I, um, I I haven't answered you for your question why Jacob uh, Jacob Frank was so um, you know attractive yeah. person. And this fragment is very much about that. As yeah, well. because I um, I think that every writer r writing about a figure, historical figure or figure invented from the mm -hmm. beginning to the end, has a ten tendency to love this figure, to be in a yeah, yeah relationship in yeah. a way and. That was the same with me. I like y Jacob Frank, yeah. but writing this this novel, uh, then I realized that Jacob Frank was a. Uh, we, I think we we will we could use the the the, the contemporary word psychopath. Yeah. So he was a manipulator, a liar, liar, um, somebody who was uh, full of uh, inner aggression and. But uh, what makes you like him so much? Because I liked yeah. him as well, immediately. I thought this is such an interesting so figure. So this is the exercise, what is this kind exercise of paradox? psychological exercise, why he was able to create a sect. Yeah. Because that there were many thousands of people were behind him and supported uh, him so also much. So I'm al I was also in a way a kind of victim of him. I had a <laughs> very ambivalent uh, attitude toward yeah. him. I, I knew that he was uh, in a in many terms, uh, a, b a bad person. And but very he is dark, also dark a very person. good storyteller and a very good... Um, uh, 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 he, he, all he does is speaking about fairy tales. Yeah, but that's, that's, yeah. Um, so that's maybe also something so you have in common. So small anecdotes, fairy tales, small myths uh, taken from everywhere yeah. he, he knew. And um, then we have to remember that his pupils, acolytes, were very simple people. Many of them couldn't write, they were illiterate people. Mm. So the stories, his stories must be very simple and, you know... Uh, and he was very charismatic as well. He was very charismatic yeah. and and uh, there is a, such a fragment in this book uh, how, and it shows um, how big problem I had trying to create this figure, mm -hmm. how he looked and how he mm -hmm. behaved and so on. For instance, we have one uh, source, historical source, written by his pupils, and it is written that he was beautiful and handsome man, and he has a great voice, and he presented himself very well. And then there is a description of his enemies, uh, Orthodox Jews, and they describing they were they were describing him as a ugly monster yeah. with a you know cracky voice and 
So this, the, 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 he is the different the person. Difference, so is in, the difference is such a big that you cannot believe that this is the description of the same person. Yeah. Thank you so much. I wanted to introduce um, our uh, second speaker to the panel, uh, Dora van Duivenbode. Um, give her a warm <laughs> hand. Yeah, you are um, the author of My Polish House. Yes. Um, so you traveled to Poland um, uh, a few times uh, in the past years, but you actually, your mom is from Poland. Can you tell us a little bit more about why you started to, uh, to write this book and why it was so important for you to dig into the history yeah, of let your me, mom's family? Before we make that jump, let me just say that I have to grasp my head around that Mr. Lesman just translated the book in 16 months. I heard it and I thought, Holy cows, how do you do that? And that it's so, um, yeah, for me, an honor, of course, to be here. So I'm delighted. Yeah. Um, what was your question? <laughs> I thought maybe you could say a little bit about why you wrote the book My Polish House, yeah. because also that's why we invited you, yeah, of yeah, yeah. I, uh, My Polish House is, as you have guessed, I think, uh, about My Polish House. Uh, a few years ago, I inherited our family house in Poland. I am born in the Netherlands, but uh, after my grandparents died and my mother died, there was this amazing house mm -hmm. which my grandparents built in the communist times with everything they uh, could get grips of, the stones or the wood. And it was, of course, difficult to get products in these days. So every time when I had uh, holidays or free time in the Netherlands, we uh, went there by yeah. bus and by car and to be with our family and to um, have this wonderful family life in Poland, to have a link with Poland still. But at a certain moment you decided to go back and to really dig into the history of the Yes, of because the, the Polish house, my Polish house, is in a Poromka, a small village nearby Oswinczym, Auschwitz, uh, where my mother was born. She and her parents lived in Oswinczym and they had this second house in the nearby the mountains. Yeah. Um, and as a kid, I didn't knew about the history because you are a kid, so you go to holidays to Oshwinshim and to be with your family. But as soon as I grew older, I studied history. Then, of course, I got to know the history of the place. And I always wondered um, why in the family and the people in Oshwinshim, it was such a difficult topic to talk about while they but were living in But I also read that, in in it. that when you were super young, I think you were in the seventh grade or something, that you heard about Auschwitz and then you thought, oh my God, that's where my family lives. Yeah, in Did school in the Netherlands, you have history classes, of yeah. course, as everywhere. And then I saw Oshwinshim in my history book and these uh, photos of the camps and the papels, the concent concentration camp poles. And then I thought, that's the place of my family, and everybody in the class was laughing about it when I said that. And that's weird. No, people don't live there. Yeah. How can they live there? How can they be happy? Mm -hmm. And I um, started to be ashamed a bit because, of course, as a kid, you want to be like all the other kids. Um, yeah, so it was weird to have this yeah. feeling that in the Netherlands, everybody was asking always, Oshwinshim people live there, your family live there. Yeah. Well, in Oshwinshim... Must be very depressing. Yeah, it was, yeah. of course, normal for them. Yeah, um, yeah. I think what is interesting about uh, your work and also what, what, um, what I see in both of your works is that um, many of it is also about the dark sides of history and um, uh, the ways in which we try not to think about it or not that's also why Jacob Frank is not a famous person because there were some reasons that we uh, didn't want to look at that part of our history in the way you described right um, so um, I was wondering why is it so hard to look at the dark parts why do you think what could you mention an example of um, uh, stories that you didn't hear, for example, when you go to... When I went there, well, it's, I think it's hard to look at dark parts um, for a country, but also when you look at a personal life, it's difficult to look at dark parts mm -hmm. um, for people in Poland, but also in the Netherlands. But um, So I think it's difficult because you... Life is, as we heard in the introduction, it's about hope for a big part. Mm. And hope is also going forward. Mm -hmm. So looking back at the dark parts um, maybe could stop you from going forward. Mm -hmm. Well, I think in the end you have to face it and then you can go mm -hmm. further. But I can imagine that people, that you could be afraid of it, to take it with you and to have that mirror. 
Olga, do you also think it, that it's becoming more difficult over the years in Poland to speak about um, uh, the dark parts of history? Because when you mentioned in a TV interview that um, uh, the Polish committed horrible acts um, in history, that, which is something that sounds not very controversial or very shocking. Um, uh, there was a really big uh, shock, a, a hate campaign against you. Um, uh, how is it possible that, it, that it's making people so angry? And what does it say about <laughs> Polish society? There are two things, I think. Uh, I Maybe think it feels I, like I a stupid still, question, you but me, uh, I think... You asked me on the beginning about my profession, and then I can use it this... As a, as, a sum, as, as a source for explanation. Every single human being has his own, uh, or her or his own sides, dark sides, uh, bad memories, uh, something we are really don't want to, to know about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And also the, the communities, and also the nations, and also the societies. So I think uh, that every culture is built it up on a uh, defense mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And this is a quite yeah. normal that we try to suppress everything what we are, yeah. Yeah, which is not comfortable for yeah. us. And you also described in the beginning during or, or the first part of the conversation that you um, started to be become a writer to be able to help people in a way and to spread a message in a way. And I would, mm. is it also for you important to write these kind of stories to make sure that people are able to relate to their history in like a way where dark things are part of our lives? Yeah, I think once again, as a, as a, uh, as a, um, psychotherapist in yeah. the past. Yeah. That um, I see really. A yeah, I treat. Um, I don't have a message in my writing. No, mm -hmm. this is too much. I, I would say, but I think that writing, literature, a novel especially, but every uh, every art is it is something which uh, which is looking for a special, uh, sometimes very uh, controversial, sometimes very uh, um, eccentric point of view. And it is something good that we can sp spread out our consciousness. It's better to be more aware than mm -hmm. less aware. So, yeah, that's for sure. So, so uh, uh, in a way, for our uh, psychological health, we have to face with those yeah. dark things. But I have it the feeling seems that to be very normal for the healthy personality uh, just to... to, to from time to time to open this, this But I actually have the idea that the well, if you look at society and if we look at Polish society at the moment, we actually see the opposite. We're not seeing people opening up and becoming more aware, but we see no. people more focused on one specific story of history. No, I, th I remember communistic time and the people, uh, yeah. the, they were more uh, forbidden subjects than now. Mm -hmm. That I think, once again, very optimistic that it's uh, what's going on now in Poland is opening for such a, such a uh, subjects. And for instance, um, when I said those three things in the television, I said very, you know, uh, something which is obvious for, for most of you. Uh, Poland was, uh, we had a very dark uh, moment in history mm -hmm. during the Second War um, mm -hmm. uh, with Jews, Polish citizens, which were Jews. Mm -hmm. We had a, a time of colonizing the eastern yeah. part of, of Poland then in the past, uh, now Ukraine. That was a uh, very aggressive and uh, cruel colonization. And the third, I said about uh, um, manor economy, which is a kind of slavery mm -hmm. and in the past time. So mm -hmm. this is things, I think that you, Dutch, you, you, you have the same, more or less. The things with colonization, the dark yeah. side with Jews, yeah. and I don't know, no, perhaps your economical system wasn't so cruel like in Poland, but anyway. <laughs> so uh, I was sure speaking, telling this in the television that I'm, I'm just, just uh, uh, that every, every, everybody knows those things. But, but your book was very well received, so you had the idea that um, I could just say these things on television, and then what happened? Yeah, but I just would like to finish my, my, my thought that just a few days ago, the Polish president, Andrzej Duda, said more or less the same what I said two years ago. So then you can see the process mm. of opening, you know? So I think sometimes that this is not the question of uh, 
this is the question of education, of openness, mm -hmm. of, of working with people, you know, so... Uh, and, um, and do you think that writers play a role in this, opening up, making people aware? Uh, yes, because writers, artists, they have a voice, I think. So, when I realized after one of my books that the people are buying this book and, you know, so then I realized, oh, the 20,000 of people read my books, it means that I have a kind of power. Yeah. So I have a voice, I can yeah. say something which is important. Yeah. And I did it, so that's the role, but this is not the mission. It, this no, is I was wondering, is it something how you to take be into account people, writing the how to, how to be just the honest uh, human being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dora, um, you read parts of the uh, book as well. What did you find most striking about Olga's work? Well, I think on two levels then. Um, firstly, the way that she, how she, she already, you already mentioned yourself that a lot is swiped under the rock mm -hmm. in uh, the carpet in uh, Poland mm -hmm. and that, um, well, you take it out like step by step and sentence by sentence. And I think the reactions, the hate reactions also following up, it's very, it's brave and that I find very striking. But pure as a novel and as a, as a literature, I find it so striking that here you see this book, which is like you said, the, the brick. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't read it yet, then you don't know what's in there and you just open this door, you open the first pages and you got, get sucked into this yeah. world and it feels really like you're there because of the yeah. details which uh, Fritz mentioned earlier. And because I also think there are illustrations in the book which play a big role mm -hmm. and help you to make the story your own. You mm -hmm. really feel, I felt at, at least, uh, a participant in the book. Mm -hmm. and, and you I don't want to leave the story anymore. No, and it's weird because it's, it's, such a, it's a different world, but it feels like today. Mm -hmm. So that is, uh, I found very fascinating. You, I would like to add one, one question that, uh, for instance, um, this book is, I think that it was important for Polish readers also because of, uh, that somebody mentioned, I think you, Gosia, that uh, 170 thousands mm. of, of uh, copies were, mm -hmm. were, were sold in Poland, so it's really huge success. But I think also that um, talking about Jews in Poland now, we, the first association is Auschwitz, mm -hmm. uh, Oświęcim and Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And nobody asked him or herself how it's happened really that so many Jews uh, was li were, were living yeah. in Poland. What was the history before, mm -hmm. how it was in medieval uh, mm -hmm. time, how it really happened that so many Jews uh, found themselves in Poland, yeah. escaping in fact from the Western Europe. So. Um, the, the Jews used to call Poland Pauline, which means uh, that they have their own own word for Poland. Okay. And it, Poland at the time, in the medieval, medieval time, was treated as a mm -hmm. uh, paradis judeorum, so the paradise yeah. for Jews. So there are many, many points of view. That's on, also on what those makes it so painful. And what makes That's it so, so making so painful. And in my humble opinion, I am I also used to think about Polish culture that. There is no Polish culture without Jewish culture. Yeah. So we are perhaps only such a one case all over the world that all those two cultures are, you know, interviewed mm -hmm. and many of Polish writers, scientists and so on have uh, had uh, Jewish roots mm -hmm. and we created something very special in Europe. And of course, this is something big and great and of course very painful and full of yeah. a, such a dark side. So but for me literature is always to remembering that the reality is much more complex that yeah. we can perceive from yeah. the first mm -hmm. side. Yeah. And those people who attacked me, I think they have a tendency to, to, to perceive reality as a something simple, dark, mm -hmm. uh, black and white. Yeah. And this is the problem. And that do is something literature can do because you were asking also what literature can do. But yeah. literature can show you that there is no such thing as good or bad and that it makes your mind flexible. It really shows the complexity. Yeah. 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 Dora, do you also see these kind of parallels, uh, parla parallels to the Netherlands when we speak about issues that cannot be addressed, the dark pages of history, etc.? Yes, of course, we have uh, a lot of dark pages of history in the Netherlands yeah. which we don't address. But do you think we are also. better in coping with them? 
No, no, <laughs> no, no. We are only humans in the Netherlands. Yeah. So I think we're all <laughs> only humans. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yes. yes. <laughs> Last time I checked. Yes. So um, no, there is as in every country. I think. What is for you the most striking example of that? Um, well, I would think the most striking example would be still that we have not found a way to uh, cope with, for example, the uh, wars in Indonesia, the colonization. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that would be somewhere to start. Yeah. Um, and how should we do? How should we do it? And what could be the role of writers to write a very good novel, complex and full of points of view? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly <laughs> like you did. Do yeah. you also see a certain responsibility when you look at society? Uh, that's a question to both of you. Do you also feel if society is going in that direction to kind of have an influence on, on that or react to that or show people that it might be different as well? I don't know. <laughs> no? No, I don't know. I'm, I'm, um... And for you personally, do you feel it as a... As a responsibility? Hmm, responsibility. I always dreamt to be a, a, um, a writer living in the somewhere in the countryside and uh, waking in the morning and uh, you know contemplate the the play the, the, the play of light on the leaves of, of, of my trees <laughs> in my orchard and so on. And all the time something is pushing me into this, you know politics, uh, into <laughs> fighting, into, you know, checking yeah. how yeah, uh, you hate have speech to relate in the to internet. It. So, in a way, yes, I am I'm human being, I'm living in it. And sometimes when I see that something, something is going wrong, so that I'm natura naturally reacting on yeah. this. But I, I really... I you wouldn't say it is a responsibility of artists and writers to speak out? Uh, we have to be honest, I think. We have to be uh, courage. Yeah. Um, so I think that it, this this kind of responsibility, I, yeah. I, 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 I you would. cannot mm -hmm. because you you would like to sit back and relax in your fairy tale, but at the same time you just cannot. Yeah, yeah. Do how do you see it? Well, I think I completely agree because. Um, of course, I just made this book, but I also uh, make documentaries. And as a, somebody who wants to make something, uh, you spend years on something. So it comes from your bones, from mm -hmm. your blood, because you want to chase something and uh, tell a story. But saying that it is your responsibility, I think that would... Me, it would block me, I think. But you want to uh, tell something, of course. So mm -hmm. it's... Like you mm -hmm. said, you um, in Dutch you say je keert jezelf binnenste buiten. It's you. How do you say that in English? You inside yeah, out. You, you put yourself. Out. Yeah, you turn yourself inside mm -hmm. out because you want something to tell. Mm -hmm. I don't want such a word when the writers have to be a fighters. You know. Yeah, I we, think that we had be we had a, a, a writer here a few weeks ago who said, I just cannot be a writer anymore. I have to become an activist mm -hmm. because what can liter uh, literature do? Uh, nobody reads it. Um, it. It has no power anymore. I have to become an activist. I but don't what agree is an with activist this. then? What is an activist? Someone that that speaks out in talk shows, on stages, that goes onto the streets to demonstrate. No, but I don't agree on that um, be being neither. an activist. Somebody can be an activist in his or her street and influence people by talking with them and helping them in another way. So what is an activist? Yeah. I think that the novel... Or by making great art. I yeah. think that novel ha has such a power. It's a very sophisticated way of communication. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it has such a great broad impact on people. So you can say, yeah. in the mm, very complex thing. And so I I I don't want to be a fighter. And sometimes yeah. I feel really confused uh, in such a situation that the people uh, recognize me. Uh, because I was a wic victim of, mm -hmm. of, of uh, hate speech, mm -hmm. so I would be, I would rather be remembered by my novels, yeah. not be a, you know, victim of so aggression. You, you know, so yeah, because you are framed then as an activist. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Before we're going to uh, listen to the very last fragment of uh, tonight, I wanted to see if there's any questions uh, from the audience. Um, is there anyone who wants to ask something to Olga about the book, about her work, about anything you've heard um, this Thank evening? You. you can take some time to think about it. <laughs> I can't imagine it's... A I'd like to ask Olga, um, because uh, the problems in Poland, isn't uh, it a little bit like this, that we have still very strong uh, uh, tradition of romanticism, which is still taught in schools, and this is a tradition which was invented to, 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 to lift the spirit of the nation and to regain the, um, the independence, but it somehow in part of the society survived up to now, and that's why we, 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 well, we have problems to tell bad stories. We mm -hmm. want to hear only good stories. What would you comment mm. on this? This is a very good question. I think that Poland uh, has always problems with identity as a, as a country, as a society, which has a place between West and East and also with, with, uh, between South and North of Europe. So we are always, by our karma, let's say, on the, somewhere on the, on the in-between. So our looking for identity is our curse, and from the other side, our, uh, our gift. So that's, we <laughs> have such a writers like Gombrowicz, who spent his writing on, especially on this subject, Polish identity and Bruno Schulz, who was also in between two cultures, as a Jew as, and as a Polish, and invented an incredible Polish language. So this, this problem with identity is going on now too, as well. So we are still in a kind of process of inventing ourself, ourselves, but now we are in a different political, historical situation. The first time in history Poland is belonging to the West Western Europe, mm -hmm. and this is one of the best moments in history, in my opinion. And um, yeah, but um, as, a, as a Polish, we have, have to change our old attitudes toward our identity and try to find something new. And I can see such an optimistic, you know, new, new ideas in Poland. And of course, we have to work on it, writing, creating, inventing, and so on. So. Uh, I would like to change, th th that our karma could change from this romantic, you know, full of feeling superior from one side, uh, mm. you know, uh, nation protecting Europe uh, against Islam or whatever, into the, the, mm, the, the much more complex identity. And I think that this process is going on. And as an optimist, because I think mm -hmm. that every uh, writer has to be optimist because it is without optimist it's impossible to finish such a book. <laughs> so, as an optimist, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, it's 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 going on and it's going in a good direction. Um, any other questions? Oh, okay, So I have a question about the process of translation of the book. Um, if there was, what did it look like? Was there communication, collaboration? What type of exchange um, and, and back and forth? How did it happen? Is it a question for me or for Carol? Both. I will start with Carol. Yes, there, were, there, was, there was some, some cooperation. Of course, uh, sometimes you c cannot find in the the dictionary, the, the words that they are using an author, and then you ask the, the author uh, what he means about it. The, this book has a special uh, uh, complexity because of the, um, the Jewish, uh, um, the, the texts in Polish, um, but from, translated from the Jewish. Uh, and uh, therefore I had to, uh, to, to ask Olga, um, for some more um, background information. Also about um, some, um, well, I, I, must, I must say something else about uh, also my, my okay. uh, um, 
my uh, relation to to this book. Yeah. Um, it is, of course, it's an, it's an historical novel, uh, but on the on on the Polish uh, book you have on the the front page the second title of the book, and uh, I have it here not for me, so I cannot uh, citate no. it, but. Um, it says that it is a conjuncture of many things, and Olga, in this uh, in this subtitle, subtitle she ends uh, with the with my imagination, which is the biggest gift of mankind, mm. and that is what I will stick to. And yeah. so, if there was some, even if there were some uh, doubts about historical facts, I think that. The author had, uh, the, the, in this case, the right to yeah. not uh, tell the, the, the story, uh, which is, has happened. Yeah. Because when and, the bishop... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, very briefly, <laughs> I wanted to go to... Uh, okay, because I, I discussed this problem with Olga, and yeah. she said, no, no, Carol, it has to be checked. When the opera um, the La Noche di Figaro in, 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 in Vieden is taking place in 7068, yeah. it is 7068. Yeah. You don't have to... Uh, it has to be, be, to be correct. Yeah. Olga, how many times uh, did Carol contact you in the past uh, 16 <laughs> months? <laughs> to be honest, uh, some questions in the end, Carol, but I like it because, in my opinion, the, the, um, the process of translating, from my point of view, it's only the question of trust. I have to trust yeah. my translators. Yeah. And I had, this, I had such a... I'm, I'm lucky because um, most of them, of my translators, mm -hmm. I know them personally. Yeah. With some of them, I'm really close. They so have to get to know your voice as well, like your literary voice. No, some of them I don't know. For instance, right. Italian, my Italian trans translator, yeah. I've, I saw her first time just two weeks ago after the translation yeah. of the book. Oh, wow. So this is the question of trust, because I yeah. think that translators are, first of all, the, they are the, the, the kings or queens, they own language and they own yeah. culture. So yeah. this is not only translating word one sentence into the other sentence, but also translating from one culture to, yeah. to the other culture. Yeah. Translating and from one word. And how does it feel for you to, to hear the, the Dutch uh, fragments of the book? I think that this is the, the, the same feeling like you have a ch child and the child is, you know, going out from the house, yeah. you know, so it doesn't also belong to me. Also a bit difficult or yeah. not? Difficult, but also I'm happy that it yeah, has proud. own. Yeah, also proud. Yeah, also proud. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so I am not an author of this book in Dutch anymore. This is the, just Carol did it. <laughs> um, some, the final fragment. <clears throat> Elzbieta Drusbatska vanuit het klooster der Sister Sienserinne in Tarnoef. Een laatste brief aan de hoogeerwaarde kanonik Benedikt Chmieljowski. Te vier leeuw. Ik zie, beste vriend, eerwaarde weldoener, bijna niets meer van deze wereld. Enkel wat ik door het raam in mijn cel kan zien. En dus zie ik de wereld als de binnenplaats van een klooster. Deze opsluiting brengt mij een grote verlichting. Een kleinere wereld komt de rust van mijn ziel ten goede. Tevens geldt dat de voorwerpen die mij hier omringen, het zijn er niet veel, in mijn hoofd niet voor zo'n chaos zorgen als al die huiselijke kosmossen die ik als een atlas op mijn schouders had, heb moeten torsen. Na het heengaan van mijn dochter en kleinkinderen is alles voor mij afgelopen. En ofschoon u me erop attendeert dat het een zonde is zo te spreken, maal ik er zelf niet om. Vanaf onze geboorte gebiedt alles... Kerk, huis, educatie, gewoontes en de liefde ons te hechten aan het leven. Alleen, niemand vertelt ons erbij dat hoe meer wij ons hechten, des te groter de pijn is die we later zullen gevoelen als wij het definitieve inzicht zullen verkrijgen. Ik zal u niet meer schrijven. Mijn vriend die, me, die met zijn verhalen mijn oude jaren heeft verzoet en mij geholpen heeft toen ik door dat onheil getroffen werd. Ik wens u een lang en gezond leven en dat uw prachtige tuin in Vierleeuw eeuwig mag voortbestaan. Net als uw bibliotheek en al uw boeken. 
dat ze de mensen mogen dienen. Mevrouw, mevrouw Esbjeta Drushbatska is klaar met de brief en legt haar pen neer. Ze schuift de bidstoel weg die naar de aan de muur hangende Christus... van wie ze elke gekwelde pees van buiten kent, is gekeerd. Ze gaat lang uit op de grond liggen, trekt nog haar bruine wollen op een habijt lijkende jurk recht, kruist haar armen op haar borst als in een lijkkist, wendt haar blik naar een in de lucht hangend niets. En zo blijft ze liggen. Ze probeert al niet meer te bidden. De woorden van het gebed vermoeien haar. Ze doen haar denken aan het gieten uit een leegte in een leemte. Het malen van steeds dezelfde korrel vol giftig moederkoren. Na enkele ogenblikken slaagt ze erin een specifieke toestand te bereiken. Ze blijft hierin totdat er, iemand, totdat er gescheld wordt voor het eten. Het is moeilijk deze staat van zijn te beschrijven. Drushbatska slaagt er simpelweg in te verdwijnen. Jenta, die altijd aanwezig is, verliest mevrouw Drushbatski uit het oog. Pijlsnel als een gedachte schiet ze naar de geadresseerde van de brief die op tafel ligt en ziet dat hij zijn gezwollen voeten aan het weken is in een kleine tobbe. Hij zit gebogen. Misschien is hij in slaap gevallen. Zijn hoofd hangt op zijn borst en waarschijnlijk snurkt hij. Och, Jenta. Weet, uh, och, Jenta weet dat het weken van zijn voeten niet zal helpen. De laatste brief heeft de hoogeerwaarde Gemeljowski niet meer kunnen lezen en hij ligt wekenlang niet ontzegeld op tafel te midden van andere papieren. De hoogeerwaarde Benedikt Gemlowski, kanonik te Rogatin, overlijdt aan de gevolgen van een longontsteking. Want onbezonnen en ongeduldig was hij bij zonsopgang naar zijn tuintje gegaan. De opvolger van Roschko, Isidor, jong en traag van begrip, als mede zijn huishoudster Xenia hadden tot de volgende dag, hadden tot de volgende dag gewacht met het roepen van de dokter... Trouwens, de wegen waren doorweekt en moeilijk begaanbaar. Hij is in alle rust gestorven. De koorts was voor zijn dood in zoverre gezakt dat hij nog heeft kunnen biechten... en het laatste oliecel heeft kunnen ontvangen. Op de tafel heeft nog een tijd lang het boek opengelegen... waaruit hij enkele regels onder een afschrikwekkende gravure bezig was te vertalen. Ze waren in zijn handschrift geschreven. De opvolger van de hoogeerwaarde Benedict die de parochie in Vierleyouf overgenomen, heeft overgenomen, besteedde de hele avond aan het doorzoeken van de documenten van zijn voorganger en het verzend klaarmaken voor de bisschoppelijke curie. Hij had ook de brief van Drushbatska geopend, maar hij wist niet wie die vrouw was. Het verbaasde hem wel dat de geestelijke gecorrespondeerd had met vrouwen. Hij vond namelijk een kistje met brieven die zorgvuldig gerangschikt waren op datum, met gedroogde bloemen ertussen vast op dat de motten zich niet in het papier zouden nestelen. Hij wist niet wat hij ermee aan moest. Want, uh, want ze bij de boeken voegen die hij op bevel zou inpakken... en naar het bisdom in Lyov versturen, durfde hij op de een of andere manier niet. Hij bewaarde het kistje een tijdje bij zijn bed. Las zo nu en dan met genoegen in de brieven. Vervolgens vergat hij ze. Het kistje schoof hij onder het bed. En daar bleef het staan, in de vochtige slaapkamer van de pastorie totdat de brieven waren vergaan en in muizennesten waren veranderd. In haar laatste brief schreef Drushbatska nog, uh, uh, nog de twee ergste vragen zijn waarom en met welk doel. Maar kan toch, niet nalaten, kan toch niet nalaten ze te stellen. Dus geef ik mezelf ten antwoord dat de Heere God ons geschapen en zondaars tegen de schepping juist met die schepping wil straffen. Zelf wast hij zijn handen in onschuld om zijn goedheid in onze ogen te bewaken. Hij zoekt naar natuurlijke manieren om ons indirect te gronden te richten. Door een natuurlijke zaak, opdat de klap minder hard zou aankomen dan wanneer hij zelf zou hebben geslagen. Want dat zouden we niet hebben kunnen begrijpen. God had immers na Aman met een enkel woord van zijn melaatsheid kunnen genezen. Maar hij gebood hem te gaan baden in de rivier de Jordaan. Hij had de blinden met zijn alomvattende liefde kunnen genezen. Maar hij mengde immers speeksel met modder en legde dat op zijn ogen. Hij had iedereen meteen kunnen genezen. Maar hij schiep apotheek, geneesheer en geneeskruiden. Zijn wereld is één groot wonderwerk.
<laughs> Thank you very much. Before we're closing the evening, I wanted to, I really like this last uh, part of the fragment. What does it mean for you, or what does it say about the book and about religion? <laughs> Sorry, too difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> too difficult question, you know. I think that this motif is repeating itself in, in the entire book. Yeah. Why the world is like it is. Yeah. If there is a it, God, it could, could be better, yeah. but why it's not better, nobody knows. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a sad note to end this evening with, but um, Dora, I wanted to ask you, what, what are your um, new projects? What are you going to do after this? After this, after the book. After the book, and, the, the, book. and the series will be yes, screened the, from, uh, from Sunday, uh, this Sunday at uh, quarter past eight at MPO 2, we have the series Moja Polska about yeah. Poland. And uh, so I'm thinking about... Um, new books. I was, I don't know if I can already say it, I was at the publisher today at the Geus to oh. sign a contract for my second oh. book. Oh, where is so it about? So it's a festive day. I don't, I won't uh, tell you yet because... Is uh, it about Poland again or not? I will go to Poland again, yes. Okay. Yes, yeah. yes. And it's about hope. That it's right. about hope and if uh, at my, f I have my phone over there and at the back I have this post-it for a very long time now, which says, what if all hope is gone if, if mm -hmm. there's no hope left, what to do. So I, I'm intrigued by what I've heard yeah. today, tonight. And I think Olga is really offering a lot of hope and she also did that uh, tonight. Yeah, you I can, can also can offer you place in Wrocław. We have a small uh, guest room with the separate mm -hmm. entrance. So I, I'll go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Olga, it, it, it has been some time already since this book was published. So what, what are you currently working on? Are you working on some new novels? Uh, after Jacob's book, I wrote this collection of short stories and also uh, the uh, fairy tale for children, which, is, which was first time in my life. And then I'm collecting my, my energy to write a new novel. I already started and there will be a, a novel once again, epic novel. Mm. Uh, but I desperately need time and peace. So Some rest. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm, I'm in, in a few days I'm coming back to Poland and I'm not going to, to move anymore. To no. your dog. <laughs> <laughs> to your dog. And could you the say something about where this new novel will be? Um, what the subject will be? It's, um, I'm living on the lower Silesia. This is a very particular part of Poland and I think in Europe because after the Second World, this, this part of Europe was completely depopulated. I mean that Germans were removed completely mm -hmm. and the new... People, newcomers came from from all the, all, all the rest of Poland and settled there, and it was a kind of melting pot of many Polish people, many cultures, languages, and so on. And I would like to start from the zero year. Mm -hmm. So how the society can can establish, can fix ah. itself from the beginning. So how we create really society. Yeah. What was the how the, all those mechanisms are working and how it is difficult. And of course, I think it will be once again about multitude, about many points of view and about negotiations, I would that say. That doesn't sound like a short story as well, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so you can take your time for this. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I would like to thank you all. I hope you got some insight into the main themes of the books of Jacob. I hope you're inspired to, um, uh, to buy it and to read it if you um, uh, haven't done that already. Um, I hope we shared some insights about what literature can mean in order to deal with the dark sides of history, the dark pages of our history. Um, and uh, yeah, if you would like to buy the book, it's on sale. Also, uh, Dora's book is on sale outside. So um, I would like to thank you very much. I would like to thank Olga, Dora, Carol, uh, and Sam, and uh, Fritz as well uh, for their contribution this evening. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.